So, you have it all figured out. You're going to outsmart the market and buy and sell your way to riches. Find out why the smartest investors in the world say you're going the wrong way. We're here to steer you in the right direction. That's next on Money Track. Money Track is made possible by the Investor Protection Trust. The Investor Protection Trust is a nonprofit organization devoted to investor education. Over half of all Americans are now invested in the securities markets, making investor education and protection vitally important. Since 1993, the Investor Protection Trust has worked with states across the country to provide the independent, objective investor education needed by all Americans to make informed investment decisions. This is Money Track. Your guide to investing and protecting your money. This is Money Track. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Money Track. I'm Jack Gallagher. You know, I'm camped out at this intersection, been here quite a while. And I can tell from this vantage point how people are misbehaving in traffic. It's unbelievable. Take this guy, for instance, right here. The big green thing doesn't want anybody passing him. That's the kind of guy he is. You know, I'm practically in the middle of the street because I don't know if you've heard, but a couple of researchers out of Toronto have actually answered that age-old question that's been plaguing drivers since they got behind the wheel. Does changing lanes constantly darting in and out of traffic, watch that guy, does that actually get you where you want to go any faster? You're dying to know, aren't you? Stick around, you'll find out. Now, probably asking yourself, what does driving from here to there have to do with investing? And Jack, where's your co-host Pam anyway? We're gonna answer both those questions in just a second, but to get your motors running, get it? Traffic, motors running? Let me ask you this. What is the most dangerous tendency or habit you can have when driving your car that also happens to be the worst possible mistake you can make investing your money? And that is our Money Track Quiz Question of the Week. And really think about your answer as we take you on this journey today. Now, we're going to do things a little differently today. We're going to start right off with our Investing 101 segment. Every week, we invite a special expert as our Investing 101 guest professor. And this week, we've asked former Wall Street options trader, mathematician, and author, Dr. Nassim Nicholas Teleb, to demonstrate how driving and investing your money have more in common than you ever knew. Nassim, I'm an amateur trader. I do my homework. I watch just enough Jim Cramer and television to be dangerous. I read just enough. I understand how the economy works. I'm good to go, man. All I want to do is trade a few stocks. It's very simple. You take the performance of individual investors, and it's far worse than the market. For a guy who made his living trading high-risk stock options, Nassim Talab has a pretty unorthodox view of how everybody else should approach the stock market. His new book, The Black Swan, forces us to recognize that some of our most basic human tendencies are just plain destructive, like believing we have enough knowledge to make a ton of money trading in and out of stocks. Out of the thousands and thousands of companies out there, a few of them are bound to have five, six, seven positive quarters in a row, just out of plain, simple, Lux. And if it is just plain luck, then that means the events that cause certain stocks to go up and down every day are truly random and therefore unpredictable. The biggest problem we have with markets is that you hear from the winner, you never hear from the losers. Investors are those who have much less frequent transactions. Do investors fare better than traders? Certainly. And it's the same behavior we fall into when we're trying to get someplace in our cars. Ever wonder, do those drivers who constantly change lanes get there any sooner than those just plodding along at the speed limit? It just seems like everybody else is going faster. Passing us by. 
one bad crash can ruin your life forever. That's emergency room doctor Don Redelmeyer, who got interested in lane-changing behavior after noticing that many of his worst crash victims had been injured doing just that. When changing lanes, the risks are always real, and they are substantial, whereas the benefits are sometimes totally illusory. Well, it turns out the lane changers don't arrive any faster. Just like the hyper traders, don't make any more money than the stock market average returns. There's nothing to be gained from the majority of lane changes, whereas there's something to be lost on each and every one of them. Every journey that you take is going to have relatively many moments of unpleasantness when you're being overtaken and relatively few moments of pleasure when you're the one doing the passing. So we're really not getting all that much joy out of each little victory, but oh, how we feel the sting of each defeat. Lose a few thousand bucks on a stock trade? That hurts. This is why you should put your money in as broad a portfolio as you can and let the market average take care of you. So I'm hearing this mathematician and this doctor both saying we shouldn't kid ourselves into believing that we can outmaneuver everybody else. But what about all those Wall Street experts who say they can beat the market? Nassim was one of them. Ah, the professionals, my friend, are just as bad. We're wasting hundreds of billions of dollars given to the workers' industry. They've done nothing for us. But that impulse to do something, nobody's totally immune, not even the seam. No. Look, you just changed lanes. Oh, <laughs> Actually, it got me in danger. Look what happened, all right? I cannot resist changing lane. I'm going to be changing lane because this lane seems to be faster. It's a gut reaction. It's, it's a gut reaction. And on a long road trip, you simply have to make some tactical changes. It turned out that this lane was faster. For the minute you change lane, look at it. This guy's going faster than right, me. Right, exactly. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But most times, he says, we win by staying the course in lots of high-quality investments where we can spread the risk. But if you absolutely have to give in to the urge to make a move, he says, take that risk with just a small amount of money. Just don't think of it as investing. Trade stocks, okay, but know that it's for entertainment, so it's too small a portfolio, so you can change lanes as often as you want, knowing that the costs are going to be minimal. And get your lane changing get your lane urges changing. out. Life will be a lot more fun, and it will keep you out of trouble. Okay? Right. Well, Pam, whether it's what we do behind the wheel or what we do with our money, both these PhDs seem to be saying it's what you shouldn't do. In other words, the most dangerous maneuvers to avoid that matter most. No, I, I hear you, Jack. And the point seems so subtle, and it's actually huge, because think about it. When it comes to investing your money, if you can identify and eliminate the impulse decisions, you're going to avoid the most costly mistakes. Okay, Pam, just drive carefully, will you? Hey, New York has been fun, and I'll see you back on the West Coast sooner than you think. Now, keep in mind, Nassim, the man that you saw behind the wheel, is a mathematician and former professional options trader. Right now, we want to hear from our favorite economist, lawyer, and general all-around smart guy, Ben Stein. Ben, you agree that it doesn't pay to trade in and out of the stock market like a madman in hopes of getting there faster, right? You just do it patiently across a wide spectrum of diversified investments and you'll get where you want to go. There's no trick. There, there was a very famous uh, Greek mathematician who said there is no royal road to geometry, meaning to say there's no special way that a king can learn it faster than a commoner. Well, as always, thank you, Ben Stein. Pam? <laughs> Pam, you were just in New York. I just talked to you there. How did you get here so fast? Road trip, Jack, road trip. Ah, oh, cross country. Man, I made it in record time. I'm telling you, you should have seen me straight through Nebraska, right through Nevada. Didn't change lanes once. You didn't change lanes once at all? Well, maybe once, maybe twice, but it was oh. fun. <laughs> and I see that uh, Chloe, Pam's dog, was navigating oh, once again. You know she loves to go for a ride. Who needs GPS with her? Nobody when you have <laughs> Chloe. I gotta tell you, the switching lane study is incredibly eye-opening, and I, I can see how the very same psychology applies to buying and selling mm -hmm. stocks. Now, don't you find it just 
a little ironic that Nassim, somebody who used to take huge risks as an institutional trader, is now doling out what seems to be very conservative advice. He actually agrees with mo most experts, other people we've had on this That's show. That's right, say. exactly. Well, safety first. And yes, he now considers himself beyond conservative, mm. I'll tell you. Now, when we were riding around New York, he confided in me that he's actually made some enemies on Wall Street really? because he argues that staying the course is simply a better strategy than trading in and out of the market. You can see how that would upset some people. <laughs> now, if you'd like to get more on the driving study or learn more about taking a rational route to investing, drive straight to our website, that's moneytrack.org. <laughs> Click on what's on Money Track, and I guarantee we won't steer you wrong. Oh boy. See how I did that? Listen to this one. Okay, time to shift gears, shall we? This is just getting real corny. You're Do you want me to put the brakes on it? <laughs> yes, and on our next leg of our journey, oh, okay, we're heading to the nation's capital. Isaiah is standing by at Megabytes Cafe in D.C. with a question for us. Hey, Isaiah, what's going on in D.C.? Hey, Pam and Jack. I own some mutual funds, and I'm not into changing lanes like you just said. But I have this one fund that has done nothing but lose money while the market is going up. And it's been doing that for a while. So are you guys saying I should just hold it and keep it and never sell it? Isaiah, there are times, as we've learned, that you have to change lanes. Now, let's just take this apart. There had to be a good reason for you to want to own this mutual fund in the first place. And I imagine you intended to hang on to it long enough for that fund to make you money as it hopefully would appreciate in value year over year. You know, but I understand now you're disappointed. So how do you know when it's time to sell an investment? That might be the toughest investing question of all time. So Manny Schifres from Kiplinger Personal Finance is joining us to help. Hey, Manny, if the reasons that Isaiah made this investment in the first place are still valid, he wouldn't want to change and sell just for the sake of change. You agree? I'm not sure that switching car lanes gets you to where you want to go faster, and I'm not sure that switching funds without having a good and valid reason accomplishes the same thing. Isaiah, what type of mutual fund is this? Uh, it's a super aggressive fund that invests in smaller companies. Uh, I'd say there are four basic reasons for changing uh, funds. One would be that the reason that you bought the fund is no longer valid. Uh, for example, you invest in a fund because the manager specialized and did well investing in small company stocks. All of a sudden, the manager has uh, shifted into mid-sized companies and large company stocks, and the fund uh, no longer uh, is investing in the kinds of stocks you thought it invested in. Number two would be uh, that the manager has left the fund. Uh, you buy a fund because it was the particular manager who achieved a certain record over a period of time. You were impressed by the manager's record. If that manager has retired or has uh, switched to another fund company, then maybe that's a reason for selling a fund. Now, Manny, what about funds that get really big over time? Do they, do they lose a certain advantage when they get huge? That's particularly a problem with, with, with funds that invest in small company stocks. Those funds become more difficult to manage. They lose flexibility when their assets grow too large. Now, you mentioned four good reasons to sell, and so far we've got three. Finally, um, there are performance reasons, and, and that's probably the most difficult reason for selling. Uh, you have to determine uh, how long a period you want to assess a fund. I'd say that if a fund has trailed its peers, and that's important, its peers, not just the market or all other kinds of funds, for a period of three, four, five years, that's probably a, a good enough period of time uh, to persuade you that you've made a, a bad decision, that it's time to unload this fund. Right, and let's not gloss over this point. It is key that you compare your mutual fund only to funds that are just like yours, right. Isaiah's. In other words, that are considered in the same category. Yeah, because Isaiah's fund invests only in small companies. Right. So he's not going to compare that with another mutual fund that buys established companies or bonds, for example. Exactly. It's got to be apples to apples. Now, those are valid reasons that you might want to sell that have to do with the mutual fund itself. Mm -hmm. You know, but your own personal situation can also drive your decision to sell. Your goals change. Your risk tolerance change. Uh, you may be investing in a fund for the long term because it's an aggressive stock fund. You think it's going to deliver great returns over the long term. Well, suddenly that goal you're uh, saving for investing for is approaching and you may want to sell your fund because you need to make your investments more conservative so you start selling perhaps gradually your stock fund and you move the money into a bond fund or a money market fund 
That's because uh, as your goal approaches and you need the money sooner rather than later, uh, you can't afford to take big risks. Well, thank you, Manny. Thanks. That was Manny Schiffers from Kiplinger Personal Finance. And as always, we have more about when it's time to sell an investment right on our website. It's moneytrack.org. <laughs> Go there, click on what's on Money Track, and you'll see our investing 101 page. Now, Pam, Manny gave us a little homework to do. Afraid so. He said that you want to make sure that your mutual fund is still investing in the same kind of stocks you originally wanted to own in the first place. Right. And you want to make sure the fund's manager hasn't Very quit. Very important. You also want to know that the fund hasn't gotten too big for its own good. Hmm. Well, you want to know how to find out all these things? In the next 60 seconds, I'm going to show you the easy way to point and click and find out all that information. Head to our moneytrack.org homepage and click on Money Minutes. There's a very cool area to screen mutual funds. Step one, type in the symbol of the fund you want to evaluate. Now, I've always wanted to know about this one fund inside my 401k plan, and the first thing I see is that Morningstar is only giving it two stars out of five, and that makes me want to know more. I look at the snapshot here, and I can see how well this fund has performed. Step three, Click on Portfolio. Here's where I can see how my money is invested. And I see it's in 28 or so very large company stocks. Hmm. Reading it, I can tell if my fund's original goal has somehow drifted or changed. And that makes me wonder whether the same people are still in charge over at this fund. So step four, click on Manager. And this tells me who's been steering the ship. See, when I bought this fund, this guy Navalier wasn't even on board. Aha! All of this information is meaningful, and it only took me one minute to find. All right, time for our quiz answer. Folks oh. might remember that way back at the top of the show, before you got here, before your 45-second drive cross-country, <laughs> yeah. the question was, what is the most dangerous tendency or habit you can have when driving your car that also happens to be the worst possible mistake you can make investing your money? i got to tell you, this one's a giveaway. This is really easy. All right, well, based on what I've seen so far, I'm going to say weaving in and out without using your turn signal. Yep, and tailgating. In this case, tailgating oh. means following somebody else's trading habits and not I thinking see. those moves through thoroughly. Ah, and that brings us to a screeching halt. Now you're doing the drive. <laughs> well, okay. have you ever seen those late-night commercials where they try to sell you uh, on the whole idea of trading commodities or futures or something really high risk using a supposedly proven or guaranteed right. system or you know a, a computer software program? Guaranteed to make you rich. That's called tailgate investing. That's what we should call it. Because you're supposed to follow exactly what the software dictates. Oh, I do. I like that term. It's a whole new investing term. But this is hyper trading, folks. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is buying and selling sometimes the very same investment several times a day. Now, these software programs are supposed to remove the impulse decisions so you can buy low and sell high without your emotions getting in your way. Right. Well, we have had so many viewers write us asking, are these programs for real? Well, Jack wanted to know, too, and here is what he found out. They spark temptation and often action with investors. Ads claiming a quick lane change across Wall Street that will land you on Easy Street. There are no magic bullets. Any claim that you're going to be guaranteed a, an extremely high return uh, should certainly be a red flag for you. I mortgaged my house to invest with someone from our church. Now my kids have to work to keep a roof over our heads. Call our office and investigate before you invest. Chris Biggs is Mr. Big when it comes to protecting investors who live in Kansas, the first state to regulate the sale of public securities back in 1911. Turn the page nearly 100 years later and Kansas skies turned gray when a convicted felon Nicholas Guarino used the heartland to break the hearts and wallets of naive investors by conning them into his bogus scheme to make money trading futures contracts. In Guarino's case, 350 people complained to the Kansas Attorney General about it. Who knows how many others signed up for his, uh, for his scheme. Guarino's website is now offline, but MoneyTrack found how it used to look. Using the web, his syndicated radio show, and a newsletter, Guarino promised ridiculous returns and money-back guarantees. This con man also convinced others that Wall Street hated him because of all he knew. 
There's the notion I think the public has that somehow the government screens everything that goes on the media before it appears to make sure that it's legitimate. And, uh, you know, that's certainly not true. Where people are given the chance, afforded the opportunity to make a 100% or 200% return on their money, all of a sudden, all uh, critical uh, thinking seems to go out the window. At the Kansas City Board of Trade, there is legitimate futures trading of commodities such as corn, wheat, and pork bellies. A futures contract is not equity in stock or commodity. It is a contract to make or take delivery of a product in the future at a price set in the present. For example, if you agree in March to buy a bushel of wheat in May for $5, you entered into a futures contract. If the price of wheat in May falls, your trade loses money. If the price rises, you make money. In this scam, investors acted like the lion, the scarecrow, and the tin man from that famous movie set in Kansas. They thought trading futures with the wizard under Wall Street was worth sending him five grand up front. Most investors got nothing other than the knowledge that they'd helped Guarino pave his golden brick road to fraud with nearly two and a half million dollars. You pull back the curtain, there's nothing there. Or a, rather an ordinary mortal there, yeah. Why, you're nothing but a great big coward. Just eight miles from the bustle of the Kansas City Board of Trade, Nick Guarino's hustle was supposedly headquartered. The Kansas address we had would have put Guarino's desk somewhere between this house and this building. Hey, maybe he worked in there. It's always been amazing to me that people will uh, perhaps go to a garage sale and uh, banter with someone about whether they're going to spend $10 or $15 for an item. But they'll literally turn hundreds of thousands of dollars over to someone that they've never met before. The U.S. District Court in Kansas fined Nicholas Guarino and company seven million bucks. One million was seized from his bank account in the Cayman Islands. But Guarino himself was never found to pay his fine or do his time. Now, if you still want to play with commodities, futures contracts, options, anything that risky, we suggest doing so with only the tiniest amount of your money. Hey, how do you make a small fortune trading options, Jack? Well, you start with a big one, Pam. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Should we just review what we've learned in the last uh, 27 minutes? Some bullets would help us, I think. All right. Okay. We want you to realize that our investment decisions are very similar to the real-time decisions we have to make when we're behind the wheel, because they are both often based on nothing more than impulses, raw emotions. Often, we're not even conscious of the behavior. And those emotions around investing are based on fear of the unknown and desire for instant riches, better known as greed. So if you can stop competing with the other drivers on the road who seem to be passing you by or making more money than you are, then you're going to make the process of investing a lot more rational and a lot more simple. And this is how you can save yourself from making the biggest mistakes, the ones that cost you the most, finally. If you're one of those people who cannot resist the urge to race around the investment track using supposedly proven trading vehicles or systems, try using play money, or at least not using your kids' college funds, because if you do that, they won't go to college, and if they don't go to college, what do they do? <laughs> they wind up living with living you with for you. the rest of their lives. That's what they do. <laughs> that is our show for today. Remember, keep your eye on the road and your investments on track. It's all on our website. That's moneytrack.org. Thanks and for watching. tell us if you have a story you want to share with us because we can all learn from each other. Except Pam here, who I've noticed is a bit of a backseat driver. We'll see you next time, everybody. I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. That's yes, the one thing I don't do. I, I absolutely don't do okay, that. Okay, you don't do I it. Don't. I was wrong. You don't do it. You were what? I was wrong. You were what? I was wrong. Sorry. Sorry. You handle the finances. I'll do the fun. That's a good song. I keep forgetting to put my foot on the clutch. New York's been fun, but I'll see you back on the East Coast, back on the West Coast, uh, wherever I am. Okay. For real. And that guy sitting right there has a computer with the script in it. He just rolls it and I read it.
simple, man. Why do you think I can do it? If it was complicated, they'd need somebody who was smart. Oh, jeez! Oh, God! Oh, you go! You, you go! You go! You go! No, after you! After, after you! After you! Seriously! Go ahead! Go ahead! Find out why the smartest and smartest and smartest, smartest inventor in the world! I'm telling you! Say, get on that horse and get on the right here! Here they come. They're the smartest investors in town. <laughs>